Good morning. Good morning. Happy Labor Day weekend to all of you. Welcome to Cross on Covenant Church. Glad you're with us. You're joining us on the live stream. Good morning and welcome. Would you stand with us for our call to worship this morning? Our call to worship comes from Psalm 103. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am praise the Lord. Let's lift our voices in song this morning. of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Praise Him, oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, that sail in heaven alone. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Thou rising moon in praise rejoice. Ye lights of heaven find a voice. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. of our God and King. All creatures of our God and King, 
Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. 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 Amen. We're going to do a VBS song from our past summer VBS. If there's any young people that would like to join us up at the front here, you're welcome to come forward at this time. And this song, uh, we're going to do All That I Am. And this song just calls us to, with all that we are, as our call to worship said, with all that we are, praise the Lord. With our hands, we will serve him. With our feet, we will go. With our voices, we will sing of his love that rescued us. Let's do this song together. All right, look at this good group up here. All right. Let all that I am praise the Lord With my whole heart I will praise His holy name Let all that I am praise the Lord With my whole heart I will praise His holy name With my hands and with my hands I will serve you. I will serve you with my feet. With my feet, I will go. I will go with my voice. And with my voice, I will sing. I will sing of your love. Of your love that rescued me. That all that I am, praise the Lord with my whole heart. His holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise His holy name. With my hands, with my hands, I will serve you. I will serve you with my feet, with my feet. I will go, I will go, with my voice, with my voice, I will sing, I will sing, of your love, of your love, that rescued me, that all that I am, praise the Lord, with my whole heart I will praise His holy dance team out hand. All right. Nice job, guys. This morning, we, we focus on the example of Christ and making Jesus our model. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 calls us to imitate God in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Let's continue in worship this morning.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me 
in your love to those around me. Lord God, that is our prayer this morning, that you would open up our eyes in wonder. Show us who you are and fill us with your heart and lead us in your love to those around us. Draw us closer to you this morning. May we leave here changed. We love you, Lord. We give this morning and the service to you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's a game we play at my house, and when I'm in a really good mood, it's very fun. And this is the game. It's called Dinosaur. Actually, this is a new addition to our game. Our game typically goes like this. Someone's the dinosaur, and you wander around the backyard and you try to eat kids. It's just pretend. And then, a group of kids stand at the top of the playhouse and try to shoot you with a Nerf gun. And if they hit you, you fall over, and then they come up to you and see if you're really dead. And then if you are still alive, then you tackle them to the ground. It's very fun. And just a couple weeks ago, somebody in our family earned the last little bit of money they needed to buy this epic T-Rex mask. And this just makes our game, can you guys hear me okay with the mic? Am I good? This just makes our game that much more epic because check it out. Isn't that fun? Now when you put this mask on, something wonderful happens. You now see <laughs> like a T-Rex. And let me tell you, it's very challenging to see your feet. All I can see is out of the sides of my head. So I have to look very carefully for the people I'm going to capture, and you can't see where the bullets are coming to dodge them. So yes, the game is ridiculous, because I wander around like this. <laughs> Tripping everywhere I go. This is very tempting and I promised my child I would not share it with anyone because it's still special. So luckily I get to, to wear it today. Today Pastor John is going to talk to us about something confusing called incarnation. Everyone say that. Incarnation. And you're going to listen for that word. And when you hear that word, you're going to know that that means when God put skin on and came to earth as Jesus. And there's a verse that we're going to hear about that's about having the mind of Christ. Having the mind of Christ. And when we have the mind of us, sometimes we don't see where we're going. Sometimes we're grumpy. But when we have the mind of Christ, this is what happens. I'm glad I'm bringing joy to you people. I can't. Oh, I got it. I got it. See, when we have the mind of Christ, this is what happens in our brains. Who's first? God. Who's second? And who's third? Me. When we put on the mind of Christ, that means we think like Christ. This is the order of our thoughts. God first, others next, me last. And do you know what the coolest thing about putting God first in our life is that he takes care of us. He fills us with his love. He helps us see 
the world the way he sees it. Not like this T-Rex mask. I don't even think I can get this on over my thing. Not like this T-Rex mask that makes our vision all foggy and blurry. But we get new lenses that help us see clearly. And I see people. I see other people. And I, I love them the way Jesus loves them because I have the mind of Christ. Now here's a lesson that I was talking with Evan this week is that when we say yes to Jesus, we don't just get this automatically on our heads. Wouldn't that be amazing? Bam, it's done. But actually, every day, we need to put this on. Every day, we need to wake up and say, oh, God, help me have the mind of Jesus. Oh, God, help me put you first and others next and me last. Because it doesn't just happen automatically. Every day, we need a reminder that God is first. Every day, we need to put Jesus' mind on. It's a choice. It's obedience. And we are not brainwashed by God, but Jesus helps us see the world around us with love and truth and grace and compassion. So here's a question I have for all of us. How do you put God first? What do you do in your day that puts God first? A common question that comes up in my house is, but I don't know how to do that, mommy. Or wife. Or I'll say that to others. I want to put God first, but I just sometimes don't know how to do that. And that's the job of the church. And the Holy Spirit in us is that we can say to each other, do you know what I do that helps me put God first in my life? I get up when it's dark and I pray and I listen to music. Do you know what helps me put God first is when I'm feeling really irritable and this guy is coming out? When I'm at work or school or with someone that is frustrating to me, I stop and I pray and I ask God, God, help me have the mind of Christ. What do you do to put God first? What do you do that helps you have the mind of Christ? Now, I'm asking you that question because that's talking about that is a way that we disciple each other. Talking about what we do is a way to teach our kids to do the same. Talking about the things we do that help disciple us grows our spiritual maturity. It grows the church body. So what do you do that puts God first? What do you do every day that puts the mind of Christ on you, in you, at work, through your hands and your feet, like we just sang, and in our voices? What a gift. What a gift that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, helping us, and with choice and obedience, we can say, less of me, God, and more of you. Let's pray. God, thank you for the Holy Spirit that is at work in us. It doesn't force us. He doesn't force us to do things, but he empowers us to do things. God, would you help us have the mind of Jesus that puts God first? then others, then me last. God, give us your strength. Give us your power. Give us your love so we can show that love to those around us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, friends. Good to be with you. We turn our attention to Philippians, the second chapter, we pick up in the fifth verse of Philippians 2. And I invite us as we walk into this passage, as we enter into it, to give our attention, to give our heart, our eyes, our ears, to let go of distractions, to put down our phones, and to pick up our heart, 
our attention and allow God, who created us and loves us best and most, to allow God to speak to us because we understand as God's people that through God's word, God has a message for us together as a people and God has a word for you. Let's listen. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, that's a good word. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. I love this man. Now, you've seen this picture if you've been around here. The man in the front, the seated man, happens to be Harold August Wick. Born 1901, Charleston, West Virginia, my maternal grandpa. And I've talked often, I've shown this picture. I, it turns out I don't have many pictures of Bam. That was his name. And this is near the end of his earthly life. But I thought of Bam just a few weeks ago as uh, some of us in the world had a um, Field of Dreams moment. Did anybody watch the Field of Dreams baseball game, the annual event in, in Iowa? Okay, a couple of people. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And it was a, it was a, it was a great Iowa moment. Do I have any shout out for Iowa today? Okay, all right, well, and, and it's about having to catch in baseball, Field of Dreams, with, with someone across generations. And for me, the person that I had a catch with, some of my, really, what I remember, my first game of catch was with my grandpa, Bam. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something about this that I've never told anyone. At the time, I was, I was, I was getting pretty old. I, I was 10. And... And Bam, I, I did the math, Bam, Bam was 70. But Bam could still bring it. He had been a ball player of some renown back in West Virginia, and today we'd call it the Velo, right? The velocity. And he could bring it. And, what I'm gonna, and Bam threw me the ball, and I had my mitt, and I caught it, but my grandpa Bam threw the... You're not going to tell anyone about this because I'm not going to... Are you? He, he hurt my hand because the ball came in with such velo, velocity. And I, I was awed. I was awed that my grandpa, Bam, could, I'd call it the heat. And he could bring the heat. And then there was even more. I could not believe it. I was in, he, he was, he took on superhuman status in my life when he showed me what is, what he had. And bam, at the age of 70, could still bring the breaking ball. And, and he threw me. And we were playing. And I don't know if I caught it or not. I probably missed it. But the ball broke. It, it curved. And so that's some of the reason why I love this man, but there also was that, that moment. So the picture I showed you, that was about 20 years after the catch. And then a few years uh, later than that, 
a good time before. That picture you saw was at the end of his life. Uh, Bam and I had a conversation. His, his beloved wife, my grandma, Lillian, had passed away very early in life. I think she was 59. It was a, it was a tragic death from leukemia. And he told me about the loneliness in his heart. And I remember we were, we were in the front seat. It was a bench seat of his 71 Dodge Charger. And I'm pretty sure, also as I recollect, I didn't have a seat belt on. Uh, imagine that. And he told me about the sadness in his heart. He said, you know, I'm, I'm so lonely. And I was, I was a sixth grader. And I don't know that I said anything, probably a pretty good response. Maybe I said, I'm, I'm lonely too. But he told me, he, he was able to verbalize how empty his heart was. Now, I submit to you and to us that my grandpa Bam Bam was exercising pretty good emotional health, especially for a man born in West Virginia. Gotta love West Virginia. But I mean, it, it, was, it was a day in 1901. I think that was pretty good emotional health. He was able to speak of his grief. Now, our summer series, we've been on a journey, whether you've been with us or this is your first Sunday here this summer, it matters not. We've been part of this journey, Emotionally Healthy Church. And, we've been, we, and we have defined in this series that our emotional health is aligned and linked to our spiritual health, and it is defined as the ability to be self-aware and love others well. And the picture of our series is an iceberg. We've, we've learned that the top of an iceberg is called the hummock, and the part under the waterline is called the bummock. That's 90% of an iceberg. And the idea and the focus in emotionally healthy church is that we look and seek to open our lives and our hearts and our being and our soul to the work that God wants to do in the depth of our lives. And so in recent weeks, we've talked about how Jesus wants to break the power of the past and calls us to live in brokenness and vulnerability and has given us the gift of limits. We can only do what we can do. And, and last week, we talked about how to embrace grief and loss and enter into what God wants to do in our hearts and lives and souls through grief and loss. Well, just a little bit more. Why, why is this series? Why did, why did we do this? Well, the tagline of Emotionally Healthy Church is this. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while being emotionally immature. And often in the church, we've been skeptical about emotions. And, 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 and we say, well, emotions are not to be trusted. And, and we've almost kind of said, well, emotions are evil. But it, it's interesting if we want to look at that in a big picture philosophy way. Actually, that particular viewpoint is the perspective of the Stoics, these people that were around the scene at the time of Jesus, but Jesus was not a stoic. Jesus had emotions, and Jesus modeled emotional health. He was self-aware, and he loved well. Yeah, we've, we've seen that, that Jesus could still be angry. Jesus could still weep. He had tears. He knew grief. One of the taglines affixed to Jesus was that he was a man of sorrows. Isn't that interesting about Jesus' emotional health? Also, we know Jesus could know great joy, and he participated, and we imagine him dancing at his first miracle in Cana. Jesus exhibited full human health. Well, today, 
we walk into the last episode of our series. And, and the first, these previous weeks have, have been on the, on the soul work God is seeking to do in us. And then this last week is, is about our focus outward. As a result of what God has done, is doing, and will do in us, how would God have us live as a model and pattern for life? And we've, and the last, and so today's focus is about emotionally healthy church, make incarnation your model for loving well. Can we say that together? Make incarnation your model for loving well. One more time. Make incarnation for loving well. All right, and we stop in this second chapter of Philippians, particularly looking at verses 6 through 11. And if you have a Bible in your hand, if you have one in your phone, I invite you to just look at the way that verses 5 through 11 are laid out. Because the English Bibles pick up something very unique and something intentional and something wondrous is going on. That if, if we just hear it, we can, we can miss it. And I, I have the slides with the words from 611, but, but that slide doesn't really pick up what the, the, every single English Bible I've looked at this passage in has. Because the text of verses 5 through 11, if you, if you look at it, it's laid out in poetic form. And there's, there's a rhythm and a cadence to the phrases. And also Bible teachers tell us that in 6 through 11, we have some of the most unique vocabulary that Paul ever used in his letters. In totality, when Bible teachers look at this passage, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, they begin, well, some of them salivate. Some of them begin to glow. One Bible teacher puts it this way. Philippians 2, this passage we're focusing upon, is the greatest and most, most moving passage that Paul ever wrote about Jesus. The greatest and most moving passage Paul ever wrote. And, and Paul, who had come to Jesus on the road to Damascus, is the, the architect and author through the Holy Spirit of a good portion of the New Testament. 20, 21 letters. So this passage that we're focusing upon, I would just call us to look at in totality the context of Philippians 2. Bible teachers, we're not sure, but apparently it was a song of the early church. And we find ourselves with lyrics. Imagine early Christians 2,000 years ago, and they came to worship probably in somebody's house. It was, it would, we would have called it a micro church. Maybe there were 12, 16 people there. And they sang, and apparently one of the songs they sang was verses 6 through 11. This is an ancient worship song of the church. And we also best understand that this was also an ancient belief statement of the church. It, we, we call that a creed, a summary of what we believe. So we do well to dive into this passage. Look at what verse 6 declares as we walk into verse 6 and then the next couple of verses. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Who being in very nature God. This is really important and significant. 
we are, it is being declared to us that Jesus, who, who is Jesus? Was Jesus simply a good teacher? Was Jesus simply a moral leader? Jesus was a good teacher. Jesus was a moral leader. But no, in Jesus, something one of a kind is going on. Jesus is who being in very nature, in form, that Jesus' essence is God. And so the reality of this passage is we are being invited to consider, oh, Jesus, this Jesus that we know about, this Jesus is God in the flesh. And one way I find it helpful to think about how grandiose this is, is that Jesus, being God, is beyond time. And Paul is lifting up the majesty of Jesus. So how majestic, just how majestic, how wow is Jesus? Let's try this on for size. Have you looked? Have you seen? Have you contemplated any of the recent pictures, what in the last month, from the new space telescope? Anybody seen those pictures? Anybody seen them? All right, wow. And this, this picture, we are, we are told, we are, we are gazing at a picture of the universe, a mere, a mere 13.6 billion years ago. Wow, that's, that's a significant length of time. Would, would people agree that 13.6 billion years is a significant length of time? This is the majesty of Jesus, Jesus as God, Jesus is beyond time. And, and even as astronomers say, well, you know, basically, as I've understood, basically all of astronomy is just blown up because we, we don't have theorems and theories and equations that can understand all of this. That's, and Jesus is beyond 13.6 billion years old. Jesus, who being in very nature God, Jesus, who being in essence God, a teacher, yes, a great example, yes, but a one of a kind enfleshment of God. John, the fourth biographer of Jesus, put it, put it this way, in the beginning, not in a point of time, but in the essence of beginning, in the beginning was the word, his poetic descriptor for Jesus. We're gazing here at this passage beyond even the beauty of the universe of 13 and a half billion years ago. We're gazing at the beauty of Jesus. Don't just allow these words to roll through your thinking and let them go. Oh, we do well to ponder and to be nourished by these words. Look at verse 7. Rather, he, the references to Jesus, being Jesus made himself nothing. We hear that along the way in the history of the universe that Jesus, the Son of God, dis dispatched by the Father, and Jesus made a choice to be made nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And here, now I'm going to note that word that Polly alerted us to, incarnation. The enfleshment of God. Jesus didn't have to, but Jesus chose to become God with skin on. Jesus emptied himself. This is beyond what we can understand, but he took off some part of his godness and stepped out of that. He came from heaven to earth. 
to show the way, a song says. And he took on humanness. Another Bible passage puts it this way, 2 Corinthians 8. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, imagine having all the riches of heaven, yet for, though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor. That's the choice of incarnation, of willingly giving up rights for others. Now, earlier this week, I, I had a wonderful theological conversation with a student at Crosstown, youngster, uh, and, and we were having conversation, and, and somehow the, this, this person is in uh, grade school, but I, I want to declare them uh, a learned theologian, and you'll thir soon know why. And, and the conversation was about, well, if Jesus was right here, what would you ask Jesus? If Jesus was right here in the flesh, the incarnate, God with skin on, what would you ask Jesus? And this, this person said, well, I would ask Jesus, why do you love sinful people? Why do you love sinful people? And I said, ding, 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 we have a winner. Wow, that's like, God, why would you do that? Why would you love sinful people? Why would you step out of your godness? Why would you empty yourself and step into humanity? Why would you do that? That's exactly the question. And of course, we know that the Bible reveals the answer because in his willingness to enter our world and to make connection, to make contact with us, it is the ultimate act of self-giving love. And the incarnation is about giving up our rights, submitting our rights to others. Ever thought of Jesus like this? Jesus is the one who submitted himself to us. Jesus gave up his rights for us. Jesus gave up his rights as the son of God to you. Jesus chose to love us, broken, fractured, messed up, sinful people, out of his heart of self-giving love. We're talking about this incredible passage about Jesus. It is a rich song about the majesty and the identity of Jesus. And I want us now to begin to, to, to go to the very first sentence by which Paul, who was the author of this through the Holy Spirit, in the fifth verse, Paul introduces the song, the hymn, the belief statement with these words, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That's all. That's, that's all the challenge. Well, was, was it much of a challenge? You, you went to church today. Uh, wow, what, what did you hear? Well, I'm challenged to be like Jesus. Is that it? Wow. We're challenged to make incarnation our model, to give up our rights for others, to submit, to say, you go first. You go. You go before me. Two, there's all kinds of ways that we can do that. I, I want to talk very specifically about two ways that we can practice making incarnation our model. The first is empathy. It was, it was a few years ago. It was, it was in a class, and it was a communication class when I was in school, and I, I remember it particularly because we talked about empathy, and I, was, I didn't know what's, what's empathy, and, our, and we, we had to memorize it. 
that empathy is defined as to enter into another's world as if it were our own without ever losing the as-if quality. There, there are some boundaries involved. To enter another's world as if it were our own without losing the as-if quality. I, I was taught back in the day when I was in school that was, that was empathy. That's what Jesus did. I found that definition of empathy timeless. Now, let's, let's look at, at very practically how difficult and how challenge, challenging we, we are. We've, we've, we find ourselves in this really difficult, challenging moment. We're kind of wrestling for the soul of our culture. And it's, it's difficult for just about everyone because we, we seem to me... From my perspective, this is John Jacoby speaking as John Jacoby. We've lost the ability to practice empathy, especially for the people with whom we disagree. And we've just lost empathy as a human practice, let alone as a practice to identify and live out Jesus' practice. And we, we are told in all sorts of ways, directly and implicitly, that if we, if we disagree with persons, if we're red or blue or somewhere in the purpleness, that if we disagree with people, we, we must hate them. We must hate them. And just to be clear, as an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Pastor John Jacoby and any other gospel-oriented pastor or person would say, that is a lie. We can disagree with people totally, but we, we are not called to hate them. In fact, of course, it is the opposite. If we're going to make incarnation our model, and if we're going to step into Jesus' steps and follow him, from putting his rights on hold and empty ourselves in this pattern and practice of self-giving love, then we need to have empathy, especially for those with whom we disagree, especially when we disagree with them. We don't need to hate them. It's contrary to the gospel. Jesus said specifically, love those whom you would call enemy. Love them. There's no option. Jesus says, love them. We make incarnation our model as we seek to grow forward in the practice of empathy to identify with another's world as if it were our own without ever losing the as-if quality. And second, we take on the mindset, the attitude of Jesus, as we gauge in something that I've always thought <laughs> was easy. It's, it's not. We just passed a major threshold, Marna and I, and, and we've, we've been 39 years together. It's been the most glorious adventure of my life. I'm totally crazy about my bride. And along the way, she's taught me that whereas back on August 6, 1983, when I thought I knew all about listening, I mean, I had an undergrad degree in psychology. And it has been suggested to me along the way that my listening skills would, it would do well for me, as the beloved of Marna Jacoby, to improve my listening skills. So noted. It's been an adventure of learning to listen 39 years. And there was this follower of Jesus who talked about listening 
This is uh, late 1930s. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, extraordinary disciple about, of Jesus. And, and Bonhoeffer said this about listening. This is nitty gritty making incarnation our model. It's about empathy and it's about listening. Bonhoeffer said this, Christians have forgotten that the ministry of listening has been committed to them by him who is himself the great listener and whose work they should share. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the word of God. I encourage you to take a picture of that. <laughs> Ponder that. That's good stuff. To be self-aware and to love well. That's the destination, the desired outcome of our Emotionally Healthy Church series. And, and we're all somewhere along the line on that journey to be self-aware and love others well. Jesus, Jesus launched a life of incarnation, establishing this pattern of incarnation, self-giving love, and also Jesus spoke of it in his epic passage in John 13, a new command I give you, even though really it wasn't new, but it was, it was new because it was fresh. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? If you practice love if you engage in self-giving love, make incarnation your model. It is the call of Jesus Christ on our lives today and tomorrow and going forward. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand as we respond in song. And as we've been challenged this morning, as we sing this song, I Surrender All, this hymn, may we just be convicted of those areas in our lives where, where we need to surrender, where we need to give up our rights for others to serve Jesus. Let's sing the song together. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all 
to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thy. Let me feel the Holy Spirit truly know that thou art mine I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord. I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender now. I feel the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation, glory, glory to his name. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Jesus, we give ourselves to you this morning, and we just pray that you would show us how we can be more like you in our lives, how we can be more of you, how it can be more of you and less of us, Lord. You came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing, the King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, take everything. 
Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure. The one that I can't live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of is all I need. Take everything. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Oh, Lord, change me only you can here with my heart in your hands father I pray make me more like Jesus this world is dying to know who you are you've shown us the way to your heart so father I pray make me more Change me like only you can Here with my heart in your hands Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus This world is dying to know who you are You've shown us the way to your heart So Father, I pray, make me more less of me. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Lord God, as your words told us, you made yourself nothing when you stepped out of your godness and into our humanity, Lord. And in so doing, by making yourself nothing, you gave us everything on the cross. Show us how we can be more like you this week. Amen. You may be seated. Want to take opportunity in our prayer time this morning to focus on teachers, staff, and those uh, children, and teens returning to school. And so if you are going to school, uh, that's your job as a student. 
That's your job as a teacher. That's your job as a staff. If, if you would just uh, raise your hand so people around you can see and just acknowledge that. And then uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And if you're near one of those persons, if, if you're good with it, if you could raise your hand uh, towards them and uh, to, to show your support of blessing. Let us, let us pray, uh, Lord God, for uh, all those in our midst and our community as we return to school. Uh, Lord God, uh, we thank you for the gift of learning. We thank you, God, uh, for the reality is that in the truth of different disciplines and subject matters, we can discover you because you are the source of all things and that all truth is God's truth. Thank you, God, for teachers and staff and children and teens as they return or start school this year. Some have already begun the journey. Some will begin the journey in these next days. And God, we pray your blessing on the teachers that are a part of Crosstown Covenant Church. Give them, God, wisdom and perseverance and fortitude for the some 180 days of instruction before them. Bless them. We pray, God, that they, you will fill them with resilient hearts. We pray that this year would be a joy of learning and of being reconnected to why they got into this in the first place. Bless God, teachers and staff. And we pray, God, for students, those, uh, God, who are uh, in 12th grade and completing high school all the way through to those, God, who are even walking into kindergarten. We pray, God, your blessing on them in this school year, that they would indeed take the light in learning uh, God language and math and history and uh, all kinds of and art and music and physical education. And we pray God for all the schools that Crosstown people are a part of. We pray God for safety. We pray God for safety from any kind of germ we pray, God, for safety from any who might to seek to do harm and have ill will at schools. And we pray, God, that you would thwart them by, in, and through the name and power and blood of Jesus. We pray, God, for a good year for these friends and for classes and students across America, also including, God, institutions of, of higher education, of college and grad school. We pray for safety, God, and a great year of knowing your goodness and your presence. And together, all God's people at the end of this prayer declare, amen. As we have opportunity to give, we keep before us that one of our spiritual practices, a spiritual discipline, is the act of contributing with generous hearts to God for the uh, increase of Jesus' kingdom in this place and around the world. We encourage you to give your offerings financially in the box in the rear of this place or online or through the mail couple of announcements this day. Church retreat registration, uh, our Crosstown retreat, is in two weeks. We have like 50-some people going thus far, but there's still a place for you, and we have a video to show. If I were to tell you in two minutes or less why I go to Covenant Pines, it's because I love that place. I grew up there. From third grade on, I went there as often as I could. And so clearly, as soon as I had a chance to go back again as a grown-up, I did. And I brought my kids there. Well, we brought our kids there. They loved it. But even though our kids are old, we still love to go there. And I don't go there for the outdoorsy, beautiful, out, you know, exercising <laughs> moments to hike or ride bikes. I go there because I can put together jigsaw puzzles 
because I'm a nerd. And I could do puzzles all day or play games. I could sit around the fire and just get a chance to know people. Otherwise, at church, you can see them, but you don't always get a chance to talk to them. And we are going to have an incredible speaker this year. I met him, actually, at a youth speaking event in January. Our kids loved him. He's fabulous. And he's going to be doing something special with just the youth on Friday night. And even though I'm old, I get included in that. So, youth people, you should come, too. Dennis, why is it that you go to Covenant Pines in two minutes or less? Well, I go to Covenant Pines in two minutes or less <laughs> because I, I too love the place. Um, it's, it's, it's just this special time that we've set aside, and you know we, you know we enjoy the, the trip up. You know, it just kind of brings us brings us together as a family, or even if it's just you and I going up. Um, I love the, um, I too like the idea that we really get to spend time with people and you get to know something about them that you would never uh, be able to in just, you know, a five minute interaction at church. So it's, it's cool. I love to be able to get to know people better. And it also does give us a chance to grow closer to Jesus and focus on our faith. And that is a huge thing. That's one of the major places that I grew roots, I would say for my faith too. And when I was in, uh, when I was a trailblazer to when I was in high school and now, when we go up there, we are fed, too. And it is, it is beautiful, I'll give you that. But I'll be inside, maybe by the treat table. Thank you, Nancy and Dennis. Next week, two, next Sunday, two special things going on. We've invited our friends from Bethel, Ethiopian, and from uh, Verbo and Axion uh, to worship with us. So next Sunday at our... Uh, at 10 o'clock worship, we will have friends gathering with us, and so some of it will uh, it will be trilingual uh, a bit. It'll be a grand adventure that's coming up next Sunday in worship. Uh, also, uh, no, next Sunday at five o'clock at Lake Nokomis, uh two individuals at Crosstown are going to be baptized. Uh, those persons are Evan Burfeld and Leif Torkelson, and so that's 5 p.m. next Sunday at Lake Nokomis Northeast Beach, the smaller beach on the east side, so that's next Sunday. Also, if you have interest in being baptized, uh, speak to me or Pastor Polly Pronto, as in today. And uh, last, hopefully you received our letter, uh, the letter from Crosstown Leadership, uh, uh, <clears throat> either through in your email inbox or through the postal service. And we encourage you to read through that. The, the highlights are that uh, we are focusing uh, in this upcoming school year, 22-23, uh, on discipleship and fellowship and heartfelt worship. And specifically, some of the things that are happening along with that, we're, we're going to continue with worship at 10 a.m. Worship will continue at 10 a.m. And we're going to make fresh effort to have our worship gatherings be intentionally uh, multi-generational and welcome to all ages. Uh, and uh, also, we are inviting everyone somewhere during the year to participate in a group called the Grow Group, and uh, more information will be forthcoming. Uh, and also, as, as part of this, and to focus on uh, children's ministry on Wednesday night as well, we are, uh, for the time being, no longer going to have Equip Hour. So I want you to know about that. Uh, some of our leaders are available uh, anytime. Uh, I'm available. Uh, uh, Sam Buchanan as our church chair is available, but some of them particularly are available in the rear of the sanctuary if you'd like to have further conversation. Friends, let's stand for the benediction and know that we are sent from this place by the Lord Jesus Christ, who has met with us, who, whether we knew it or not, the Lord Jesus called us here and now sends us out and says, know this, never forget it, never will I leave you. Never, ever 
will I forsake you. In the week ahead, when things get difficult and things get conflictual or things get hard or there's grief or pain, know that the Lord Jesus says, I am with you to the very end of the age. Amen.